morning, ladies and gentlemen, honored judges. Generation Z. That is the term that journalists have coined for my generation. And it's a bit ominous, if you ask me. I mean, what comes after Z? I don't know either. But maybe it's true that some of that same uncertainty clings to conjectures made about this generation of young Canadians. Here's the paradox. It's the 21st century. The potential is limitless. The future is now. But it doesn't always feel like that. Because there's still so much pressure on young people today to solve so many of the world's problems. We all know there's more than just flying cars missing from our brave new world. And it doesn't help to hear it said that kids these days all have their noses stuck in their phones, or that we're pessimistic and indifferent to the world around us. I think those are some pretty inaccurate generalizations. I think that we have new resources at our disposal to tackle the problems of a changing world. And I think that young Canadians have the willingness to use them. And one of our greatest resources is certainly technology. It's one of the defining features of this generation. Having a cell phone in your pocket means that at any moment, you are only seconds away from having a conversation with someone on the other side of the world. Having a computer in your home means that with a quick Google search, you can answer almost any of your questions. Of course, we tend to only think of the usefulness of our electronics on the days when we forget them at home. But their potential in education and other applications is near limitless. And sure, technology is a double-edged sword. Around the world, we can see it being used as a means for destruction and oppression or as a distraction from reality. But in the right hands and coupled with the desire to create change, it offer, it's an incredible tool that we can use to improve our society and our world. And trust me, there's no shortage of problems that need solving. Having easy access to information has also made it painfully easy to be aware of all the problems in the world around us. The Arctic is melting and wars and famines seem to draw on for ages. Equality is far from perfect in the world or even in our own nation. These are just a few of the challenges facing young people today. And every few weeks the media explodes with some new crisis for us to worry about. With our TVs perpetually running, our media feeds filling up, and our phones going off with live news updates, some days it feels as though all the problems of the world are piling up just to crush us all into oblivion. So maybe it's not surprising that young people have developed a reputation for pessimism. But here are a few things you won't hear in the news. Extreme poverty in the world today is low, just 10% compared to 75% in 1950. In fact, the last 50 years have seen incredible improvements in global literacy, education, health, and freedom. Now, this doesn't mean that all our problems are solved and we can all kick back and relax, but should serve as a reminder that the issues in the world today are not insurmountable. This generation just needs to learn how to address them. And we don't need to wait to start. I am a firm believer that before you can change the world, you have to change your own neighborhood. Young people today need to be involved in their local communities because that's where you learn how to work together with others to address real world issues. We also need to be good Canadian citizens. We need to recognize the differences between people from across the country, be engaged in politics and care what happens to the country we're going to inherit. But now, more than ever, there's the importance of being a global citizen. Advances in aviation and communications technology have made the world into a much smaller place. And so many of the issues that affect Canada also affect the rest of the world. But we can go even further. This will be the first generation that will also have to have an interplanetary mindset. Sure, a Martian landing may still be a few decades off, but it's coming closer than you may think. And the best part about space exploration is that it relies on our belief that humanity can cooperate to achieve great things, that there's still excitement and wonder to be found in the universe, and, that, and also that the future is something that we can look forward to. 
And that is probably the reason why I don't like the term Generation Z. The world doesn't need us to be the last of some older era, but the first of a new one. We need to keep cultivating our drive to use our skills, our creativity, and our technology to improve everything around us. In short, Young people are vital to Canada's future and to the world's future because it is our actions and decisions that can steer the world away from crisis, injustice, and inequality and into a better, more hopeful future for all. We just need to work together to build it. Thank you. Three words. 99 years of use. The concept of remembrance and where it all came from. Good afternoon, judges, officers, family, friends, and fellow cadets. I am Flight Corporal Harmony Delorier of 62 Grimsby Phantom Squadron, and today I'm going to be telling you about the term lest we forget. Canada is a vast country, filled with resources and pride. But more noticeably, we are filled with a history rich in both bravery and sacrifice. To this day, people all over the country pay tribute to those who have fought and fallen for our belief system. We also pay tribute to the innocent lives taken at the hands of conflict. Lest We Forget is a term that originated from the poem Recessional by Rudyard Kipling. It is, competed, it is repeated consistently throughout the stanzas, encompassing the powerful feelings that occur when we lose someone close to us. This phrase was used again at remembrance ceremonies in 1919 to speak of the great loss our country had suffered. Today, we continue to use the term Lest We Forget to show our respect for those who felt immense pain and loss due to global conflict. And even though the short phrase has the power to represent so much, it means something different to everyone. For example, I think of red poppies on jackets, tears and services at grave sites, military service medals, and television specials. I think of Canada 150 celebrations and the hardships Canada had to endure to get to where we are today. I think of years of sitting through remembrance ceremonies and contemplating what the people around me were thinking, how they had been affected. Back in May, I had the opportunity to travel to Vimy Ridge with my cadet squadron, and one of the cool projects we had to do in order to qualify to go was to write a piece on one of the identified local casualties. We were each given names and some information about their service, but I wanted to go deeper. So I found the contact information for Mr. Philip Lomax, the last living descendant of Private Abraham Lomax, a soldier who died valiantly at the hands of battle in Vimy Ridge. When he met with me, it was different from anything I had ever experienced. Mr. Lomax's photo albums and family heirloom collections from Abraham that show Philip's true pride in his grandfather's service and his ultimate sacrifice. I also learned a great amount about how it impacted two generations of that family. I can still hear it in his voice, how he wished he'd gotten to grow up with his grandfather, a kind and loving man who not only left his wife and young son, but a thriving business to support his belief in freedom. When I was writing my piece on Abraham, it was almost surreal, the feeling I had, holding his postcards and his medals. But what was even more moving was standing above his gravesite and telling his story. I never thought it would be so hard to say goodbye to someone I never had the chance to say hello to. People like the Lomaxes are one of the many reasons I choose to remember. This experience altered what the term lest we forget means to me. I look forward to carrying on Abraham's story and memories to my children and grandchildren because the best way to honor his sacrifice is to continue to tell his story, bringing true meaning to the term lest we forget. This is especially important to me as Philip is the last in his bloodline and has now passed on his memories to me, ensuring that the sentiment and courage that came with such a heart-wrenching sacrifice did not become lost to time. Lest we forget has been a part of Canadian ceremonies and culture for almost 100 years, and as a country, we have truly worked to earn it. We have played numerous roles in global conflicts, such as World War I or World War II, but we have also completed peace mi peacekeeping missions in places such as Cyprus. In simpler terms, lest we forget means let us not forget. Let us not forget those who were unable to make it home, those who were in the wrong place at the wrong time and lost their lives because of conflict. <coughs> let us not forget those who were just trying to make a difference and to support a cause they felt passionately about. Let us not forget those who made it possible for football players to kneel during the anthem, people on the internet to voice their opinions, and our nation the right to vote. During World War I, just two minutes before 11 a.m. on November 11, 1918, Private George Price was shot and killed. Price later became known as the final Commonwealth casualty, 
He was also the last of more than 66,000 Canadian casualties. The role these lost lives played in the war give us 66,000 more reasons to remember. People like Private Lomax and Private Price are the reasons that all of us are here today. Without their sacrifices, we would not lead the lives we currently do. And by remembering and paying our respects, we are ensuring that their sacrifice was not in vain. And so on the 11th day of the 11th month, at the 11th hour, we will remember them, lest we forget. Track and field range, effective speaking. Think about the last time you competed in a competition. Two years ago, I competed in my first ever cadet biathlon competition. In case you don't know, biathlon is the coolest winter sport. You ski and you shoot. Now guess how I did during that competition? I came in second. Second last. Second last may seem like a bad spot to be in, but it only fired me up. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever felt lost, broken, let down by yourself? Well, today I would like to share with you my secret weapon, perseverance. It'll put you back together, pick you up, and push you forward. Last year, I went back to the same competition for the second time, tried hard, but still didn't win anything. It hurt. I had thought that I was a decent skier, but how come I didn't go anywhere for the second year in a row? I felt broken. I wanted to quit. But then, I heard an inner voice. Never give up. Never give up? For what? Don't worry. I'll put you back together. The voice was from perseverance. It fired out my spirit, and it got me back on track. I didn't quit this year. I went back for the third time. This year, to prepare for the third competition, I signed up for a biathlon training camp in the first week of January. It was so cold. Minus 18 with the wind chill. It was minus 28. But we still had to go out for skiing and shooting. Snow and wind combined almost destroyed me. When I finished my first week of skiing, my body was frozen. I couldn't feel my fingers anymore. When I got into the range, the shooting platform, I could barely hold my rifle. I wasn't shooting. I was shaking. Seeing me not functioning, my coach led me out of the range and into a heated cabin to warm up. A few minutes later, I can finally normally again. My coach then asked me if I wanted to go back, but I shook my head. I wanted to quit. My spirit had already sunk to the bottom. But then I heard an inner voice. Never give up. Never give up. I'll put you back together. The voice was from perseverance. It gave me strength and it got me back onto my feet again. I completed the training camp and was ready for the third competition. This time, I was aiming for a medal. During the third competition, we were to ski for three loops and shoot two bouts. I dashed out like a flying arrow. My skiing was great, but when I for my first bout of shooting, everything went terribly. I only shot one target out of five. Each missed shot would cost me a 20 second time penalty. When I got out of the range, my legs were heavy. My heart was heavy. My hope to win a medal was gone. I wanted to quit, but then I heard an inner voice, never give up, never 
give up. But where is my hope? Don't worry. I'll put you back together. The voice was from Perseverance. It rebuilt my confidence, and it got me back onto the trail again. I skied as fast as I could to the finish line. I was the fastest. That got me a medal, a gold. competition, where I won another gold medal. And it was this gold medal that propelled me to the National Cadet Biathlon Championships. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever felt lost, broken, or down by yourself? Take my secret weapon, perseverance. It'll put you back together, pick you up, and push you forward with perseverance. I was able to come this far and make my squadron proud. With perseverance, I will achieve three sets of goals. Goals in cadets, goals in school, and goals in life. Now, I would like to challenge every single one of you. Persevere in everything you do. Not only would it get you to the finish line, but more importantly, it will always put you back. Young people these days, we've all heard it. Generation gaps lead to misunderstandings and a lack of empathy for our youth. Unfortunately, popular conversations in our society tend to focus on a group's downfalls and problems. <coughs> There's too often a focus on the negative. So today, I'd like to focus on the positive, and there is a lot to say. Hello judges, guests, and fellow speakers. I'm Flight Corporal Sparl. And today, I will speak to you about the determination, innovation, and hope that can be seen in youth these days. I will speak to you about how youth are playing a lead role in making changes for the better and how our youth will impact Canada's future. In Canada, we can look around and see many leaders. On a large scale, politicians, social activists, law enforcers, and military officials. On a smaller but no less important scale, our teachers, community volunteers, and parents. The youth of today will fill these positions and become the leaders of tomorrow. In the near future, it will be in the hands of today's youth to overcome obstacles, make positive changes, pave the road for future generations, and help Canadian society thrive and grow. You don't have to wait till tomorrow to see the impact of today's youth. Most recently, youth fed up with the loss of yet more of their peers in the recent school shooting in Florida, have confronted the lip service of politicians and demanded that action be taken against gun violence in the United States. Youth like Malala Yousafzai, who bravely spoke out against the Taliban and now continues to fight for education and women's rights, is a shining example of the huge impact a young person can have. Right here in Canada, youth are making a difference. Becca Schofield, a teen from New Brunswick, started a global kindness movement called hashtag Becca Told Me To, encouraging people to spread random acts of kindness. She began this movement in response to learning of her terminal brain cancer. Hashtag Becca Told Me To soon became viral and encouraged thousands of people to try and make their world a kinder place. In a video with TEDx, Becca stated, kindness is not an ability that we're born with or without. It's more of a decision to be made. She was awarded the Governor General Meritorious Service Medal. Sadly, Becca lost her battle with cancer and passed away February 17, 2018. Becca's influence lives on, still encouraging not just Canadians, but people around the world to be kinder. Alia and Van Hamilton are just two youth who are actively involved in fighting for social justice. They have worked to reunite children living in third world countries with their parents. According to CTV News Winnipeg, they have made it possible for over 25 children to be reunited with their parents. In 2015, several young people were named Young Canadian Innovators by the Manning Foundation. Among the winners was 18-year-old Dan Alfaral. He created an image-based test to determine how our brain reads facial expressions technology that can better help doctors diagnose mental illnesses and mood disorders. 
Another winner, 17-year-old Samna Aziz, developed a bone cement that is non-toxic and biodegradable. An article from Global News claims it has potential to replace the current generation of cements used to repair bone fractures. There are so many more incredible Canadian youth who continue to use their bright ideas to benefit society. According to Statistics Canada, the proportion of Canada's population aged 24 and younger has been slowly declining over the past 40 years. Our youth only make up approximately 13% of Canada's population. That is frighteningly low, considering their importance to this country and the role they will play. Today's youth will have to deal with pressing issues, like climate change and the urbanization of planet Earth. Finding alternatives to fossil fuels and ways to preserve animal habitats are, will be among the challenges the future leaders will face. Despite the size and abundance of challenges, I have faith that our youth will rise to the occasion as they've already begun to do. The youth of today have not only been able to contribute to society through their innovation, determination, and kindness, but have also had both a national and international influence. Our youth have demonstrated that instead of being ruled by social media, they have the skills to filter through the mass of information now available and become informed citizens. Our youth have proven themselves to be a driving force who will not be manipulated, but who will instead use technology to be heard louder and farther, to support hope, justice, and change where needed. A lot has been placed on the shoulders of our youth. I believe we have what it takes to overcome obstacles and make positive changes to Canadian society. Again, I have talked about how today's youth are tomorrow's leaders, the incredible change they are already making, and how they are ready to face the challenges of the future. What is required of all of us is to believe in, encourage, and celebrate our youth, because strong Canadian youth are the key to a strong Canadian future. Have you ever wondered what Canada has contributed to the world of aviation? A great aircraft far beyond those of its time? What if I told you that we had a project that did just that, but was cancelled before it was finished? Good afternoon, everyone, officers, judges, guests, and my fellow cadets. Today, I would like to speak about an extraordinary advance in Canadian aviation history. It was a new all-weather supersonic jet interceptor. It was called the Avro Arrow. The CF-105 Arrow, made by Avro Canada, was a project for the Royal Canadian Air Force. After World War II, the most threatening military weapon was the atomic bomb. These devices were dropped from high-altitude bombers and fell towards their targets below. The Avro Arrow was meant to be implemented across the country at various Air Force bases where it could be launched to intercept and destroy any incoming enemy bombers before they reached their targets. On October 1957, an Avro Arrow was wheeled out of a hangar in Malton, Ontario, which is now part of Mississauga. It was then presented for the first time to, for, it was then presented for the first time to the public and the press. Crowds surrounded the aircraft and gaped at its sleek, and streamlined shape. Like a new sports car, it was nothing like they had ever seen before. It had a massive wing area of 1,200 square feet. If you can picture a standard two-story townhouse today, that's only about 30 square feet bigger. That's absolutely massive for a fighter. On the same day, the Canada's aviation pride and joy was presented to the public for the first time the Soviet Union stole the attention away from it with their launch of the Sputnik satellite into space. This marked a great advance in space technology, but also unfortunately marked the beginning of the end of the Avro era. With technology to launch objects into space, it was only a matter of time before the Soviets could also launch missiles containing nuclear warheads towards their enemies. The conventional means of deploying nuclear bombs from high-altitude bombers were replaced by intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs. Now, without being able to defend against these missiles, 
The arrow was rendered near useless. The Canadian government had already put in millions of dollars into funding the project and would have to put in even more to complete it, not to mention the several million dollar cost to manufacture each finished aircraft. With all the bills left to pay, and now becoming less and less useful as newer weapons developed, the government under Prime Minister John Diefenbaker questioned whether or not it was worth it to continue paying. They had already funded most of the project and put hundreds of millions of dollars into it, not to mention already put in hundreds of millions of dollars into it. Should they just leave all that money to waste or put even more money into a project that could soon become obsolete? The decision was made and the great Canadian project came to a sad end. The project was cancelled and over 14,000 Avro employees working on it were laid off. The RCMP feared that there may have been a mole inside the company and all materials and documents associated with the arrow were destroyed to prevent, them from to prevent them from being leaked to other countries. Canada's aviation pride and joy was destroyed and sold to scrap dealers in pieces. A brain drain of several brilliant Avro engineers and scientists to NASA led to the end of Avro Canada as a company. There's still hope of finding or recreating an error. I recently visited the Warplane Heritage Museum here in Hamilton with my squadron. I had the great opportunity to see the preserved windscreen and engine of an arrow there. Last September, a scale model of an arrow was spotted on sonar upside down at the bottom of Lake Ontario. There's currently a team of people on the Race Bureau expedition who are planning to recover this aerodynamic test model from the depths and the eight others said to be down there. They've been given a $500,000 grant to continue their search, and a submarine should be scouring the lake bed as I speak. Was the cancellation a good move? I think not. But what has happened is in the past. We need to focus on what we can do to correct this tragic waste of Canadian time and resources. We can only hope to find more pieces and models of the aircraft and possibly recreate a functional one to show the whole world what could have been and what Canadians can do when we put our minds together. Canada was a world leader in aviation technology. Where are we today? And where will my generation take us tomorrow? Although this may come as a shock to many of you, when I first started cadets, I hated it. I absolutely despised it. Now don't get me wrong, I wasn't forced into cadets or anything. I joined because I wanted to try something new. But there was only one problem. I was extremely introverted. On our first day, we were told to wear our salt and peppers black dress pants, white dress shirt, and a black tie. I still remember that day like it was yesterday. It was hot outside, so I decided to roll up my sleeves. Merely a couple of seconds after walking in the complex, a senior cadet came up to me and said, you are a cadet now. The first thing you will learn here is that this is not a fashion show. Unroll your sleeves, look to the front, and stop talking. I had not been talking. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, fellow competitors, honorable judges, and patient timekeeper, I am Sergeant Prajapati, and this is how my life in cadet started off. It had only been about five minutes, and I was already terror-stricken, anxious, and more hesitant than ever about staying in the program. Nevertheless, I persisted. About two weeks of doing basic drill, I had had enough. I decided to join band. I thought that if I join band, I can stand in one corner and play my instrument without marching. Right? Wrong. I couldn't have been more wrong. Turns out that in band, not only do you play your instrument, but you march while doing so. Although I was shocked at first, I can probably say right now 
that it was one of the best decisions I made in my cadet career. I was a shy 13 year old, I didn't talk much. But in band, I made my first few friends. They introduced me to their friends and soon, I became more integrated into the squadron. I wasn't just another recruit. I was another recruit that actively participated in the program. Now with my newly found confidence from band, my parents encouraged me to try summer training. I was so reluctant to go at first. Mom, Dad, you want me to spend my summer on a military base, wearing my uniform, marching back and forth and back and forth eating bad food. I had scarcely survived one year of cadets. Was I ready for camp? Needless to say, my decision to take basic survival that first summer was remarkably life-changing. I made friends at camp that I still regularly talk to three years later. I took risks at camp that I never, ever would have expected myself to take. And that misconception about the bad food, don't even get me started on their potato salad. It's so good. Around 20,000 cadets attend summer training across Canada each year. That's 20,000 cadets building memories and making friends for life. 20,000 cadets, just like me, becoming better citizens and better leaders. So cadet life has molded me into the driven teenager that I am right now. And I said this a couple of times, cadet life. But what does it really mean? So one thing that I believe that we should never forget is that cadet life is simply the life that we as cadets live, whether we're participating in the program or we're at school, extracurriculars, at home, or even years later when we've graduated from the program. It is simply the life we live over time based on what we've learned in the squadron. Now, I know many people that would argue that we don't learn anything in cadets, but that's not true. Let me tell you what I mean. From tagging in Poppy Legion, I've improved my deportment, my self-confidence, as well as my communication skills. From FTXs, I've learned the importance of friendship. From summer training, I've learned how to always, always persevere, no matter how hot it gets outside. From band, I've improved my leadership. From sports nights, I've improved my teamwork. And even something as mundane as polishing my boots, I've gained something that I've never had before. Patience. So, as you can see, cadet life is more than just learning about aviation, learning about planes, polishing your boots, and marching around doing drill. It is more than that. It is about making friends, building memories, and as cliche as it may sound, it's honestly about having fun. Around one million cadets have been part of this program since it was founded in 1941. Currently, we have around 456 air cadet squadrons across the country. <coughs> that adds up to about 52,890 cadets. 52,890 air cadets whose lives are probably being changed just like mine. So now, although this may come as a shock to many of you, when I first started cadets, I hated it. I absolutely despised it but it's grown on me. I spent hours of my time in the cadet program and I don't regret most of it. It has molded me into who I am right now and this small choice that I made when I was 13 years old has made me who I am. As someone once said, until you spread your wings, you will never know how far you can fly. Community service, to volunteer, to give up your time for the benefit of others. What do those words mean to you? Seems rather cliche, but for some high school students, these words may only amount to just a requirement. Now looking right in front of me, you may not be in high school, so let me ask you this. What does serving others mean to you? For some, these words may spark some recognition in their daily lives. However, for others, these words may not be so high in the priority list in our ready long to-do list. Ladies and gentlemen, officers and fellow cadets, good afternoon. I'm here today to challenge you to get out of your comfort zone, 
and to adopt a lifestyle of empathy. When I first joined the Air Cadet program, I wasn't as vertically advantageous compared to others. I was small, short, timid, and quite soft-spoken. Moving on to my fifth and final year, I wish I could say I grew much in height. However, I have grown as an individual. I've become more confident, more outgoing, and a proud citizen in my community. However, this would not have been made possible without the amazing volunteering experiences that has been given to me. Whether these experiences lie in a local legion or in a very cold corner of a no frill selling poppies. Through these experiences, I have created in me a sense of identity, a sense of pride, a sense of value, and a sense of worth. I have learned that it is the most humble of actions that speak the loudest words. Now, you may not think much about a giving of a poppy to a little girl or boy. However, the impact is profound. Through this volunteering experience, you are helping the next generation remember the lives being sacrificed. You are helping the next generation see the importance of remembering. You are helping the next generation develop values of compassion. Compassion is like learning a new instrument. There are some parents out here that may know the terrors of seeing your child come home with a new instrument and realizing how many hours of hot crust buns you'll have to endure. Because learning an instrument is not easy, and so is having compassion. That is why high school students are called for 40 hours of community service, just so they know what it's like to have and contribute in their community, to strengthen their community. Earlier today, I asked you to adopt a lifestyle of empathy. Empathy is the ability to feel what another person is feeling, even without having to share the exact same experiences. This phenomenon has led to a neural social science that studies the exact neural structures that are activated in this first-hand experiences. Now, there are many questions yet to be answered, yet we do know this. Our brains are wired to help. Our brains are wired for empathy. In contrast to sympathy, which is a form of pity, to have the capability to empathize is the catalyst for compassion. Yes, we are designed to help others, but there is a drawback. We fall to the flaws of society. We become consumed in our daily stresses and worries, and we neglect to become the Good Samaritan. We become so worried that our views of this world around us become this narrow, straight line of tunnel vision. So what can we do to empathize? I believe that everyone empathizes to many different things. We have to take a step back from that narrow tunnel vision and look to the issues in our community. We need to turn on the news rather than turning a blind eye. So once you find that one or two or three things that truly move you, don't stop there. Transform your motion into action. Ask yourself, what can I do for the betterment of my community? Because it is important to teach our children the important lessons in life. The wise Albert Einstein said this, only lives lived for others is a life worth living. So in conclusion, I want to ask you this question one last time. What does serving others mean to you? Are you built for empathy? And can you take up your time for the benefit of others? Because it is no longer hot cross buns in the living room. Because you can become an instrument of compassion. Good afternoon. My name is Warrant Officer Second Class Claire Poulin, and I'm here from Atacokan, Ontario, representing the 600 Starfighter Squadron. The ripple effect. It is just so expansive, isn't it? A world war which occurred so many, many years ago, still has very raw and very strong emotions attached to it, from coast to coast to coast. Honorable judges, officers, 
parents, fellow cadets, and guests, you may think that a war which occurred so very long ago would have nothing to do with me, a millennial born 86 years after the start of the war. In fact, my cadet squadron was so touched by this world event that we fundraised an entire trip focused on the 100th anniversary of the First World War for 12 cadets. You may not think that this is a very large task. However, us cadets and our families fundraised over $50,000 in a remote community of 2,500 people over a period of just two years. When people said, those kids are up to no good, it meant we were out fundraising, badgering the people of our community for money again. Through the Royal Canadian Air Cadet Movement, I've been taught and now teach history lessons with important reference to the First World War. I am well acquainted with Canadian flying aces such as Billy Bishop, Raymond Collishaw, and William Barker. The battle on the ground may have been better documented. However, the battle in the air was just as ferocious and intense. The air cadets in my squadron have the passion for learning about the cooperation between the Royal Canadian Air Force and the Royal Naval Air Service during the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Because of the dynamic instruction and true commitment on my teacher's part, I am proud to be able to continue to offer this instruction to future generations of cadets and possibly inspire a future Air Force pilot, airport operator, or aerospace engineer. Connected with the local legion, branch number 145, there was a program through the schools learning about veterans in our families and communities who had served in either of the world wars. It was a very humbling experience to realize just how linked we all are to these wars. Through time and research, we were able to recognize these veterans during a presentation at the local schools with special focus on children directly related to the veterans in our town. Along with others who are part of this project, I even learned a thing or two about my family history and now know about the sacrifices that our troops overseas and at home still face each and every day. The largest project that I had direct contact with regarding the First World War and my cadet squadron was the trip that I took to Vimy Ridge. After fundraising for two years funding this event, the main attraction was the Vimy Ridge Memorial. Along with my fellow cadets, we spent a full day touring the memorial, the battlefield, trenches, and of course, the Vimy Ridge Monument. Never before had I seen so many soldiers' names inscribed on the base or entirety of a statue such as this. 11,285 names of missing Canadian soldiers are inscribed on the base of that monument. I would just like to take a moment to realize just how many people that is. The looming monument stands a strong 27 meters tall, secured on an 11 ton base and surrounded by a 250 acre piece of Canadian owned land in France. The sheer emotion of that reserve rendered the 12 cadets, including myself, speechless, something which is quite hard to do. Armed with the knowledge from our Canadian tour guide, we ambled throughout the expanse of grounds, silently taking in the view, the memorial, and most of all, the heaviness which hung over the whole area. A tranquil serenity which 100 years ago was anything but silent. I will never forget what I've learned this past year. I started sitting humbly in cadet lessons to teaching them. As my dedication and interest in this world history grew, I partnered with the Legion, the local schools, my own cadet unit, and I eventually earned this once in a lifetime trip. I am proud to be able to continue to offer this instruction to future generations of cadets and to continue to learn myself about the ultimate sacrifice that these soldiers gave, all for freedom throughout Canada and the world. With the advent of the internet, it is easy to see Canada's most breathtaking views straight from the comfort of your own home. 
A quick Google search for Canada's most picturesque views yields many familiar results. Lake Louise, Per Se Rock, Niagara Falls, and the Rocky Mountains. But one view, which we can see without having to travel much, without having to spend any money, and without even using the internet, is one which is very easily accessible to many of us, simply looking up. As breathtaking as this view is, however, it is one which is denied to many Canadians. By one estimate, over 80% of North Americans are unable to see the stars at night. Such a reality makes it easy for the everyday Canadian to simply look around us and assume that nothing, has good, can, nothing good has come out of the space above us. Such an assumption, however, would be horribly mistaken. Why, you might ask? Ladies and gentlemen, honorable judges, I aim to answer that question today as we go back in time through the history of the development of the final frontier and how it affects life closer to this planet. To start, we turn our eyes to the American city of Colorado Springs. Located near the former home of NORAD, the Space Technology Hall of Fame seeks to highlight and empower the accomplishments of scientists beyond this planet. Founded in the 1970s in response to a burgeoning space sector, this organization seeks to, prom to promote and to bring into the public eye important science which touches every corner of our lives. Among the foremost technologies on this list is the Global Positioning System, or GPS for short. This system allows a receiver anywhere on the surface of the Earth to mathematically determine its exact location, often, too, within the precision of a few inches. GPS technology has been incorporated into many of the devices around us, such as our phones, our cars, and the navigation systems we use on our cadet field training exercises. Without it, much of our society would grind to a halt. Aircraft navigation systems would cease to function. Google Maps would no longer work. And our search and rescue operations with Canada's military would become immensely more difficult. But GPS would not have been possible without scientific developments beyond this planet. Four years after Neil Armstrong touched the surface of the moon, asserting dominance of space over the Soviet Union, the American military needed a reliable and precise way to determine the location of its satellites in low Earth orbit. Scientists reasoned that a system of 24 satellites orbiting the Earth would be able to accomplish precisely this task. Thus, NASA and its allies, including Canada, would easily be able to avoid satellite collisions and make orbital rendezvous much, much easier. But this goes so much further than simply adapting space-based technologies for our own use. Space exploration can lead to entirely new discoveries about the nature of this planet. In the early 20th century, Albert Einstein made the revolutionary an announcement that time was relative and moved faster when, than when we are here on Earth than when, on objects that are physically moving faster, such as jet fighters or asteroids flying through deep space. The origin of satellites orbiting the Earth at speeds of several kilometers per second provided a perfect opportunity to test this theory. Positioning an atomic clock on board a satellite, American scientists noticed that the clock in space ticked slower than the one on Earth by a, a several hundred nanoseconds every day, proving that Einstein was indeed correct. But Einstein's century-old theories might seem to have little relevance to today's society. But our astronauts in space discover so much more than just that. On the International Space Station, astronauts from space agencies around the world, including Canadians such as Chris Hadfield, work together to show the earthly potential of space-based technologies. For example, we grow zucchinis in space to test plant nutrition. And 
We stud take pl millions of pictures of our atmosphere to study the pollution that we put into it every day. So some of you might look at the billions of dollars spent on space agencies in Canada, America, China, and elsewhere, and quickly dismiss them as complete and utter wastes of money, more worthy of being spent on education or healthcare or lowering our taxes. But I hope that when you, after you listen to my speech, all of you will think a little harder about how that technology might benefit us. Will it make our lives easier? How about open up new and never before seen fields of science? Our country has been through 150 years of toiling progress. And to continue that, all we need to do is look up. In the beginning of time, there was nothing. And then, there was us. Creatures only made distinct by our ability to think, to create innovate. And then we made fire, a tool that would earn us a rank at the top of the food chain. But we didn't stop there. From the atom to deoxyribonucleic acid to the theory of relativity and now a smartphone. We have accelerated beyond expectations. But like a particle that has reached the speed of light, is there no further we can go? No more Teslas, Curies, or Einsteins? Good afternoon, honored judges, officers, and my fellow cadets. I'm Sergeant Arrow Inave, and I believe that the advancement of science is not at a standstill. However, if we continue at the pace we're going today, we are never going to solve our energy crisis here on Earth, make more efficient aircraft from the sky, or make it past the moon in terms of space travel. When you think of energy production, the first thing that comes to mind may be coal, or better yet, the huge hydro dams that power most of our homes in southern Ontario. Different in their sources of energy, they are all fundamentally the same in terms of how they work. In the case of a hydro dam, water pushes a wheel and creates energy. However, my question is, why do we have this urge to think of rotational movement? Wouldn't it be easier to think in a linear fashion and generate energy from what is around us? This is called ambient energy harvesting, and it's a type of energy harvesting that I've been looking into for the past two years, essentially creating energy from untapped resources. Imagine. Being able to take a walk and charge your phone because they're tiny piezoelectric generators in the sole of your shoe. Or being able to simultaneously light a pizza shop and make pizzas from the excess heat produced by ovens. No fancy generators, just plain science. All this occurs naturally in crystals such as with shell salt and quartz. Sure, efficiency so far proven to be only a fraction of conventional methods. However, I believe in order for us think about long-term use of energy production, we must consider ambient energy harvesting and start thinking linearly. Spinning wheels are so 20th century. Furthermore, it is the same sadly with aircraft. We have had over a century since the first powered flight, yet the aircraft of today are much different from their predecessors 100 years ago. According to the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, there are 5,000 aircraft in the sky at any given moment. Right now, we are using Earth's precious little airspace on aircraft that I believe can be improved, need to be improved. The good news is it's already possible. Does the name Leonardo da Vinci ring a bell? Good. How about his famed flying invention, the human-powered ornithopter, a machine designed to mimic a bird's unparalleled grace in the sky by the use of mechanical wings? It may seem far-fetched. However, in this way, we must think repetitively instead of looking back at the way we've done things before. The cool thing about being able to engineer something is that we don't have to wait for nature to take its course. We can make positive and much needed change. Now, last but not least, in fact, it's infinite, space travel. Ever put on Star Trek, Star Wars, or Doctor Who and wondered what it'd be like to actually travel around the cosmos like it's nobody's business? Well, I have. I remember when I was younger, I was shocked when I found out that the only extraterrestrial body that we've ever been to was the moon. I mean, I was certain that we had diamond mines on Neptunes and colonies on Mars. It just didn't fit the expectations I had as an elementary school kid. However, I believe I found a solution. In order for us to move past the top of our earthly food chain to mastering the cosmos is by looking back at our own planet. Take the phylum Tardigrada, also known as water bears. 
microscopic animals resembling that of a pudgy six-legged bear with a pig face. Yet, they're the most extremely tolerant beings discovered on Earth so far. Think TARDIS, not the doctor's spaceship, but tardigrades in space. Used initially funded by the European Space Agency in 2008, they sent tardigrades into the depths of space, where they survived with minimal damage. Now keep in mind that the vacuum of space entails huge amounts of radiation and huge amounts of dehydration, which can lead to cancer in humans. So picture this. The astronauts of the future wearing spacesuits resembling that of, wait for it, a pudgy six-legged bear. It may seem far-fetched, but I believe in order for us to go into space, we must look back at those that have already done it. So by and large, whether the solution be through flying rocks, floating planes, or water bear spacesuits, we as a collective people can and must advance our progress in science. It's true, there are no more Einsteins or Hawkings, but we have musts and we have tandems. That one invention of fire that made a strong then is not what we need now. We need the girl who doesn't talk much, but dreams of curing cancer. The eccentric boy who chooses to play in the dirt because he believes that ants are 10 times stronger than humans and is determined to prove it. We have accelerated, yes, but stopped, we haven't. Because that's the cool thing about infinity. It goes beyond. The ground beneath my feet was rumbling. I remember grabbing my mom's hand and feeling very confused as a six-year-old child, fully pressed against the window of the airport terminal. I covered my ears as a loud, sudden bang came from outside. I turned my eyes to the sky and saw the F-18 fighter jet that had just broken the sound barrier. Seeing this really put into perspective all the stories my father told me of his F-18 flights through the military. I was in total awe. This moment really kick-started my dream to become a pilot and follow in my father's footsteps. I wanted to be the one who made the ground rumble and the sky produce an ear-shattering bang. From that moment on, Every time my father would talk about any of his aviation highlights, I would pay attention without hesitation. I remember the ones he spoke of most fondly being his air cadet experiences through the glider and power pilot scholarship programs. This made me eagerly wait for the day that I would turn 12 years old so I could join the air cadet program and experience everything that the cadet life has to offer. Finally, my birthday had passed and I was able to join 364 Lancaster Squadron. I remember being filled with pride after completing my first cadet night as I rushed over to the gliding list with all the other level ones to put my name down. The moment arrived for me to hop on the bus to the Chatham Kent Gliding Center. The 45 minute bus drive couldn't have been any longer. Once at the airport, I was filled with excitement after discovering I would be one of the first cadets that got to go on the glider. My nerves grew as one of the flight surgeons from my squadron directed me towards the open canopy and helped me strap myself in. After the pilot had hopped in, the flight surgeon gave me a thumbs up, closed the canopy, and we were off. As we climbed, I could hear the speed of the wind grow with every second. Detached from the tow plane, the pilot began to explain all the different maneuvers in a circuit. Listening to what he was saying really drew me into all the technical aspects of flying. I soaked in every word. Even after being back on the ground, I couldn't wait to learn more. Moving through each level of cadets helped me achieve many things. Not only did I learn several technical aspects about aviation, but I also learned new things about myself. The social aspect as well as taking leadership positions helped me conquer my shyness while talking with others. Through the ground school classes, I learned how to analyze dangerous situations that could occur in the air, as well as how to cope under pressure during these events. Through the six-week survival instructor course at Blackdown Cadet Training Center, I learned what to do in the event of a crash. This allowed me to properly know how to build a shelter, collect food, water, and how to perform emergency first aid in the field. This knowledge grants me the opportunity to plan my squadron's field training exercises so other cadets can learn the necessary skills to perform in an emergency situation. I've also been able to enhance my musical abilities through the squadron band. Every Sunday, the cadets get together to spend hours practicing their music as well as their drill to compete in the regional competition. Every year, we travel with the squadron drill teams to showcase all of our hard work and dedication to fellow cadets from the region. My goal this year is to place for provincials. My next goal, however, is to be a part of the Power Pilot Scholarship Program. Through this summer course, I'll be able to gain my pilot's license, and this will start off the first steps to my career as a pilot. 
Now on this course, not only will I spend hours of learning important aviation material in the classroom, but I'll also get to spend hours of hands-on training in an actual aircraft. Once I've completed this course, I plan to return back to my home squadron and pass down all the stories to the possible future candidates of the Power Pilot Scholarship Program. Hopefully this will inspire them just as my father inspired me with his stories. So what happens after the cadet life? I've been a part of the Air Cadet Program for five years now and during those five years have spent almost every single night of the week at the squadron. This is now something I often think about as the end of my cadet career sadly and slowly approaches. Before the end of my cadet career arrives, I hope to pass down all my knowledge, experiences, and skills to other cadets from the region, including members of my family, just as my brother, the Chief Warrant Officer, has done for me. I'd guide them, but wouldn't control them while showing the route that I took. I'd encourage them to pave their own path and develop their own experiences, but not burden them with too much information. I know for sure that once I'm out of the Air Cadet Program, I'll never forget the things that I've learned. I'll continue to finish the path seeing the F-18 set me on all of those years ago. Hopefully, I'll be the one who makes the ground rumble and the sky producing ear shattering bang, and who inspires the next kids to join the Air Cadet Program so they can experience the cadet life. Canadian history. Now, when I say those words, what comes to mind? For some people, it might go something like this sitting in the back of a classroom, listening to a teacher, going about something that many of the students really just aren't interested in. As you can tell, some people see Canadian history as something that is very, very boring. But I strongly disagree. Good afternoon, honorable judges, timekeeper, officers, parents, and my fellow cadets. I'm L.A.C. Furtado, and today I'm here to share with you a little bit more about Canadian history. To start, Let's answer the question that many of us may be thinking. Why does history even matter? Now, although this is an open-ended question, and there are hundreds of responses, my response is because everything is made from history. For example, take these lights. Back in the olden days, people could only use fire or heat lamps for light. As time went on, the light bulb was created, formed by electricity, and the light bulb continues to change in many ways for the better, such as now being able to have LED lights, which are better for the planet, or having motion sensor lights. However, to make these new types of lights, creators had to look at the history of what worked and didn't work from the past in order to advance in the future. In this same way, Canadian history helps us to see what went wrong and right and use it to our advantage to be better in the future. Now, let's move on to some real Canadian history. The War of 1812. Now, you've probably heard of this in one of your history textbooks, but why am I telling you about it today? Well, the War of 1812 is su extremely significant to Canadians for two main reasons. The first is because in total, eight battles were fought, and seven of these battles were won by us, the Canadians. This included battles such as the Battle of Washington and Baltimore, in which the Canadians burnt down the White House. The second reason that this war is important is because of the many historians who took place in order to make the war the way it was. For example, take Richard Pierpoint. He was a former slave whose promised freedom if he fought for the British during the War of 1812. Thankfully, he was freed after the war and went on to contribute to the early civil rights movement in Canada. Another example of a famous Canadian historian is Laura Secord. And no, she isn't just the face of a chocolate company. Laura Secord was a British woman who had found plans of an American attack and very thankfully underwent a difficult journey in order to prevent it. Overall, the War of 1812 is extremely significant to us as Canadians and certainly cannot be forgotten. Canada is always changing. From women first being able to vote in 1916 to Ontario raising the minimum wage, Canada has changed over the years in many ways for the better. To start, let's talk about females. 
In 2011, there was a shocking 69 women in the House of Commons. However, today, in 2018, there are 88 women in total. This shows us an increase of many women joining in a matter of only approximately seven years. This goes on to encourage female youth, like myself, to take part in politics and voice our opinions by giving us role models that we can aspire to be like. Personally, this has affected me because when I'm older, although it sounds far-fetched, I want to be the Prime Minister of Canada. And so I can look at role models of politicians who have gone before me and see things that they did and didn't do and use it to my advantage to be better in the future. Canada Day. We celebrate it every single year. Whether you're waving a flag at a parade or sitting on your couch watching something on TV. But why do we celebrate? And how did it all start? Canada was started because of something known as the Canadian Confederation. If you aren't familiar with it, the Canadian Confederation is simply a contract in which all the parts of Canada joined up to become as we know it today, or just simply Canada. The reason this took place was because of the British government, who had ruled Canada at the time. They believed that the Canadians wouldn't be able to support themselves in the event of Americans attacking. And therefore, they felt as, the, as if that Canada on its own would be much better and have much better defense. It was formed by people known as the 36 Fathers of Confederation on July 1st. And now, although Canada Day <coughs> is more than 150 years old, we still celebrate it. As for why, well, the answer is simple. We're proud to be Canadians, and we definitely should be. Overall, Canada's vast history is truly amazing. It is just events from our past and helps us to advance. Thank you. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow. 61,000. 45,400. Entre les quoi, rangé par rangé. 516. 148. Now you're probably wondering, what's with all the numbers? Those numbers, ladies and gentlemen, are the reason for my speech today. They are the Canadians lost within World War I, World War II, Korea, and Afghanistan. They are the people that we have not, that we do not, and that we will never forget. Judges, cadets, families, friends, and most importantly, veterans, I am Flight Sergeant Trenner of 543 Wing and Valiant Squadron, and this is my speech, unless you forget. Almost everyone today knows about the conflicts that have gone on in our world and may know someone who has taken part. So my first reason for talking about lest you forget is because my family has fought on behalf of our country. My great-grandfather fought in the Korean War and is one of the 516 fallen. There is now a Lake Trenter in Manitoba in honor of his sacrifice. My grandfather served in the Navy and my papa, who fought in Vietnam, served in both the U.S and American forces, uh, sorry, Canadian forces. My uncle, who is currently serving this country, has done multiple tours of Afghanistan. So the reason I never forget and will always remember is because of my personal ties to our history and our veterans. Now, I know bringing family and war into the same topic may have its conflicts and consequences. However, I'm using this notion to further strengthen our memories of these honored Canadians. Family is one of the most important things in life. And for those that give the ultimate sacrifice to protect someone they don't even know, it seems unrealistic. Yet these men, men and women did that and continue to do so every day. Just imagine giving up everything to defend a nation and sometimes missing out on life's greatest moments just so others can have their own moments. If they can do this, shouldn't we as a nation respect them honor them? Shouldn't we, to the biggest, to the simplest act of respect, remember them and continue on their legacy? Of course we should. We should remember them, lest we forget. Part of being a cadet and having a military family is having the opportunity to go beyond the public experience and get personal with each event I do. Last year, I went to Petawawa to visit my uncle and march in the Remembrance Day Parade. 
now it may seem like a regular parade, turned into a 4D movie for me. In the front, I had veterans with medals, the likes I have never seen, and stories I've never heard. In the back, I had my papa and uncle, which meant that there were three generations of my family marching along to honor our military. It was an amazing event, and one I will never forget. Another personal experience has been my journey through school. In grade school, we would charge the snow as a class just to get to the local Remembrance Day ceremony. Now in high school, we honor Remembrance Day through student-led initiatives. We invite veterans to speak about their experiences and tell us their stories. Our award-winning band takes time away from preparation just to master musical tributes for the ceremonies. Our art program fills the halls with creations of imagery to help us remember. It makes me proud to see we build a foundation of remembrance among our culture, lest we forget. Finally, I would like to share with you a very important and very moving event that happened in my life. It was a stormy, snowy, windy day. But I was on the flag party for this Remembrance Day, and I was honored because I was rather new to be in a position of importance and responsibility. The whole ceremony was like a blur with the speeches, reading of the fallen, and laying of the wreaths. But then, our world stopped. And I should have been looking forward, but I found myself drawn to watch the steps up to the cenotaph. And it was there that I saw him. A veteran, most likely in his 90s, who had served in the Second World War, was coming up the steps. And despite the weather, his thin uniform, and his age, he did not shudder nor shake. Instead, he saluted proudly to the comrades who had gone before him and relinquished his poppy. As he marched back, he looked up only for a moment, but it seemed like a lifetime. A tear flowing down his face. Our eyes met, and then he smiled. All of this caught within that moment has had a huge impact on my life. And I will never, ever forget. Hopefully, after hearing my speech, you will never forget either. In Flanders' field, ne n'oublions pas, lest we forget. <laughs>